Well, ahoy, mateys. Are you guys ready for vacation Bible school? Hey, doesn't this stage just look incredible? Hey, thank you, church family, for the time and attention that we put into reaching the next generation with the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? It is worth it. It is worth it. They need to see our joy, and it needs to be passed down. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Galatians chapter five as we continue our walk through our sermon series on the fruit of the spirit. Uh, Ever since Easter, we've been looking at um, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit that becomes ours. He takes out our heart of stone and insert a heart of flesh, and we get the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit so that when we gather together on a morning like this, we are God's living temple. And we've been walking through the fruit of the Spirit. We've been looking at the evidence that is produced because he indwells us. God's character becomes ours. And we begin with love and joy and this morning, peace. In the New Testament, we get certain snapshots of scenes, but it it will do you well as you read your Bible to pause and to meditate on what these scenes mean. Mark chapter 5, Jesus goes on the other side of the Sea of Galilee to a city of the Gerasenes, and he encounters a man that we simply know as the Gerasene demoniac. He is... He has been possessed by thousands of demons. It didn't happen all at once. It happened over time. The snapshot that we get is that he's become so angry, so uncontainable, uncontrollable, that he lives outside the city. They have tried to chain him and he has broken them. He cries out day and night because he has anguish in his soul. He is harming himself. He is harming others. Can you just imagine the shame that his mother feels? So outcast that the entire city says, go live amongst the tomb. Because you're a wild animal and you cannot be contained. And then one day Jesus shows up. And in an encounter that maybe lasted five minutes. Can you imagine? The torment to peace. To peace for his soul. Can you imagine that change? The violence, the anger, the uncontrollable screaming and self-harm, all of that to peace. It's what we're going to be talking about this morning. The reality is, is that there is a peace that man longs for, but he doesn't have. Because our sin has separated us from our creator. And only in Jesus Christ can that restoration, can that water the living water from a deep well that drinks down and seeps into our soul, can it ever be found? We're going to be talking about the peace that the Holy Spirit brings upon men and women, young and old, all who've come to faith in Jesus Christ. Listen as I read in Galatians 5, picking up in verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, 
impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I uh, forewarn you, just as I have forewarn you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we have gathered this morning around your word. We have sung your praises because your word says you inhabit the praises of your people. We come to you in prayer right now, longing to hear a word from you and that your spirit, even as Christians, Father, our, our peace is fickle. We we leave your presence, we come and go, and we, we carry the weight and the burdens of the world, and we long to be in your presence, because to be in your presence is to have peace. And Father, to be able to rest in the truth that, that through Christ, your peace towards us is, is fixed for all of eternity. It's fixed. And that we have peace with you. And that, that that peace overflows into our lives and to others around us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three kinds of peace Three kinds of peace that the scripture talks about. The first is the peace of the atonement, the peace that God has made with us in the cross of Jesus Christ, a fixed attitude towards those all who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, that God the Father looks and sees you through the lens of the blood of the Son, and he has a peace towards you. Your emotions and your, even your obedience, it, it may toss, go up and down as the waves, but the scripture says that the Father is satisfied in the finished work of the Son and that he has peace. It's the reason that the scripture, Jesus sits at the Father's right hand and bids us to come. You can come. You can come. You mean I can enter into God's presence? I can come before the holy throne in heaven? Yes, come. Because you have peace. That peace is the foundation for the other two forms of peace. It makes these other two forms of peace possible. Remembering that all the fruit of the Spirit, the origin is in God himself. Now it's important that you understand that in the fruit of the Spirit, this peace that's talked about, contextually, this peace through the atonement is not actually what is in mind. Because the peace of the, of the atonement is fixed, and here we are commanded to abide, to fight for, to produce this fruit in us. But we begin here because it's the foundation for the other two forms of peace. But this leads me to a very interesting point before I move on, and that is that it is possible to have salvation, to have peace with God, but to still lack peace in our lives. In these other two areas, to not have peace because we're not abiding, because we do not understand, because we haven't put into practice and let the Spirit have his way in us. The second peace is a peace that God gives in our lives, the ability to walk out in peace. Now, it's important that we start here before we move on to the third kind of peace, which is peace with others. And contextually, that peace with others is the primary peace that is being talked about here. But we need to start here because as we will find, 
We must be filled up in order to overflow peace to other people. You see, if the Spirit of God doesn't give you a peace that is greater than your fears or your anxiety, if you lack peace in life, you will have no reservoir of which to draw from in order to be a peacemaker to others. If you are anxious, if you are worried, if you are angry, you cannot give peace to others. In fact, you will do the opposite. I've shared with you guys before that my best friend in junior high caught his father in an affair. As in, he caught him. And I happened to go over to his house that same day as he wept in devastation that just shook his foundation. His parents soon divorced. Fast forward into high school, the joy, the peace of life had vanished. He was a different kid, hung out with a different crowd, a crowd that that seemed to just seek out trouble and circumstance, and he fought all the time. It's like he was looking for fights. See, but he was really fighting the wrong battle. The reality is, is hurt people hurt others. Anxious people make others anxious. And angry people stir up strife. They have no reservoir to overflow peace to others. Is your heart filled with worry, anxiety, fear? Are you envious or resentful because other people seem to have it so easy, so well, and you don't? Are there previous hurts that continue to steal your peace while everyone else just moves forward and you're stuck in the past? One of the last things that Jesus shared with his disciples before he left, John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. There are two promises that Jesus gives from this passage. The first is that in the world you will have trouble. There are always going to be people and circumstances that try and steal your peace. The same things that steal your joy that we talked about last week steal your peace, sin, failing health, finances, difficult relationships, the fear, the what ifs of the future. All of that will steal your joy and your peace. In fact, if you do not have peace, you cannot have joy. And simply becoming a Christian does not remove those obstacles from your life. In fact, Jesus promises it won't. In this world, you will have trouble. But look at his second promise. I've overcome the world. Take courage. I can give peace. Peace that is overcoming. Peace that is greater than your circumstances. If we are to define peace, we would say it like this. Peace from the Holy Spirit is not the absence of conflict. Listen to me, so often that's how we view life. We just think, God, if you could make all of this stuff go away, then I'd have peace. If you just give me what I want then I'd have peace. It's not what he's offering. But rather is an inner rest, an assurance that Christ is working all things out. Peace is a trust, an ability to wait on God, on God's timing, that God is in control, that he is working, that he is greater than any situation or circumstance that I'm facing. 
So when you are struggling with a lack of peace, it means your Jesus is too small. Your situation has overwhelmed your size of Jesus, and it's time for you and I to see him as he is, seated in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is name, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And God has put all things in subjection underneath his feet. Guys, it's okay for us to say in faith, Jesus, I think I've made you too small. Will you allow me to see you more of who you are in your sovereign character? I, I can only know you this much. I need you to be this big or this big or this big to overcome these circumstances. In fact, as you mature as a Christian, you will realize that's what God's doing. That is what God is doing, putting you in situations and circumstances where your previous size of Jesus isn't gonna be enough. It's not gonna be enough this time. That's okay. God is stretching that muscle of faith so that your peace will, re peace will return. One of the most helpful scripture passages and the whole of scripture about finding the peace of God and abiding in it is Philippians 4, 6 through 7. You should memorize this. You should get a tattoo of this. Put it right here so you can read it. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Have you lost your peace? Come to God in prayer, in everything. And when you come, before you come with a heart and an attitude of self-pity, because that's what we do. We come with self-pity. Before you come with that, lead your heart into thanksgiving. Pause and begin to declare to God all that you are thankful for. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the finished work on the cross. Thank you that there is a fixed attitude towards me. Thank you for my church. Thank you for your provision in my life. We have abundance. We have so much to be thankful for. You, you root out that self-pity heart and you begin to replace it with thanksgiving. And you know what he promises? God's promise, not mine. He promises a peace that will begin to flood and overflow in that situation. A peace I need you to notice something. He did not promise that your situation would change. You know, so often we miss God. We miss God answering our prayers because we think the situation didn't change. He didn't give me what I wanted. He didn't wave a magic wand and it all disappear. It's not what he promised. So often, his promises are that he will give you a peace that is greater. In fact, one time I was working through, uh, working through a book that just listed out and highlighted the prayers of Paul in the New Testament. You know what I discovered? Overwhelmingly, Paul prays for faith in the midst of the trial. He does pray for circumstances to change, but it's pretty rare. Overwhelmingly, he prays for faith to overcome this peace, this promise that we are overcomers. Do you remember Peter walking on water? After Jesus came out, 
It's a beautiful picture and illustration of what it means to walk with God in peace. Matthew 14, Jesus comes in the middle of the storm, the storms of life, and this is a perfect illustration because Jesus comes in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the night, and he's walking on water. And, and Peter cries out to Jesus, and Jesus says, come. And while Peter has his eyes fixed on Jesus, you know what Peter does? He walks on water. You think about that? I mean, we all understand Jesus walked on water, and we're like, yeah, he's the son of God. But Peter walked on water. And then what happened? It says it right there in the text. Then he began to look at the waves and the storm. And in his mind, he said, "Uh uh-oh, what is going on here? He began to sink. So often, that's a perfect picture, an illustration of where our eyes are intended to be in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the trials of life. Cast all your anxiety upon him. Be thankful and fix your eyes upon him. On this mission trip this week uh, in Yucatan, as a church, right, we, we prayed for this trip and we prayed for divine moments, opportunities that God would go before us. We know we're there for such a short period of time that God would just let us know that he is in the middle of this situation and that he has gone before us. Let me, let me tell you an awesome story. A couple days ago, we were in, in groups that were going to take food into the colonias, into particular homes, people that uh, don't make enough money to live, and we're bringing them packs of food that are going to last them a week. And we went out in teams And one of our teams, uh, led by Brandon Hines, his team went to this particular house and as they knock on the door, they had no idea, but they were entering into a situation that was chaotic. See, here's what had happened. This family was suddenly moving on a dime. They are moving because gangs in the area were extorting them for taxes. They were saying, you got to pay us whatever money you, uh, that they demanded from their small businesses in order to stay in that area. That, that family didn't have enough money to feed themselves. And suddenly these, these gangs are saying, you have, to, you have to pay us or we're going to kidnap your family members. We know where you live. And when our team showed up and they knock at the door, the family is frantic. They are packing. They are saying, we don't know what we're going to do, but our lives are on the line. We got to get out of here. And they're frantically packing. And there we knock. And as the team began to realize the situation, Brandon just began to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. The plan of salvation. And right there in that moment, at the door, the father of the household receives Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And then the the team begins to pray over them, begins to pray over this intense, incredible situation. And the visible, noticeable peace of God began to sweep through the room. You think about this, because suddenly in in that moment, the fear washes away and it's replaced with a peace that God is near, that God is on his throne. Incredible situation, by the way, that we need to continue to pray for. The peace that God gives that can only come from him and when it shows up in our lives is noticeable. So this leads us to our third peace, peace with others. The third kind of peace that the Bible speaks of here is the primary peace of this context because it's 
contrast to the deeds of the flesh. The deeds of the flesh that are outlined just prior to this, when you read through it, you realize now when he gets to peace here, you see that it is an overflowing peace, that we become peacemakers, that the fruit of the Spirit that begins in a vertical relationship that comes from the foundation through Jesus Christ that he begins to give us in our lives as it's worked out now begins to turn horizontal and you and I are called to be peacemakers with others. In fact, if our peace that we claim to have with Christ never shows up this way, there is always a right to question the vertical. If it never shows up horizontal, there is always a right to go, uh, I don't know that you understand that vertical part. So now let's begin to dive into that. Are you a peacemaker? How you make peace with others almost always involves being humble, a willingness to compromise, and thinking of others first. It's why one of the key definitions of love is being a peacemaker. So how do you do that? Well, again, the supernatural peace that we've been highlighting that comes here fills up our cup and allows us to lay down our rights as we deal with others around us. Because God has made us his priority, we are able to make others a priority. Look at the vice list again in 19 and 20. Strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. You see, the underlying factor of all of those things is pride. It is the flesh and man scratching and clawing, trying to puff ourselves up, trying to say, I am good enough. I have enough worth. I have to push others down. But in God, in Christ, you have all of that. He has made you his priority. He has made you his son or daughter. He has poured out his love upon you. He fills up your cup, which then allows you to do the same to others. And so it's why in the New Testament, repeatedly the command is given that you and I are called to be peacemakers. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort. That means you take the initiative, Christian, make every effort to live in peace with all men. Do you remember the picture of Jesus on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What a magnificent picture of laying down your rights to make peace with others. And Peter picks up on that in 1 Peter 2, 21 and said, Christians are called to do the same. That picture, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You and I are called to do the same. So practically, what does it look like in our relationships to be a peacemaker? Number one, you watch your tongue. Do you speak as if you will give an account for every word that you speak? Because Jesus says so in Matthew 12, 26. We all know this adage, you can say almost anything, it's how you say it. You see, a peacemaker pays attention to the tone in which we interact with people. Guys, we live in a culture of scoffers, polarized and divided. Due to social media and the rapid news cycle, all anyone can do is, is score cheap shots and points by scoffing at other people. We don't even disagree with grace. Our political debates have simply become hunting for 30-second sound bites. It's not even debate anymore. It's not even reasonable. We're just hunting for 30-second sound bites to make your opponent look like a moron. Where is the Christian peacemaker? Someone with character who shows the person on the other side of the issue some dignity and respect. 
Listen, I'm not saying we have to agree with culture. Here's the other crazy lie that culture has produced. And that is, if you don't agree with everything I say, then you're being intolerant and you're being a bigot and you're coming at, listen, that's nonsense. The Christian peacemaker has the ability to stand for truth but to do so with humility and to give the opponent respect and dignity so that the opponent would understand their side of the argument. They're not just treated and cast off. You're an absolute moron. You, don't, you can't say anything that's worthwhile. Guys, that's all our culture does. Where is the Christian peacemaker? Where is the one who's filled with the character of Christ and is able to handle conflict? Are you quick to say you're sorry, to apologize for your portion of the problem? You see, a peacemaker is willing to take the first step because Christ took the first step with you. You hear me? Christ took the first step with you. It also means we don't jump to defend ourselves. That we allow God in his timing to fight for us and to vindicate us. That your godly character will rise to the top when you trust God to do so. Paul would rather suffer wrong than go to court against another believer because this would drag the name of Christ through the mud. Be dignified with your grievances. Deal with them behind closed doors rather than go public. These people who get on social media and rant and rave about their problem with so-and-so, good night. It looks like Jerry Springer. Once you have gone public, you have multiplied the problem and you now include anyone who will listen. Have some dignity. Paul says he would rather be wrong than drag Christ's name through the mud. And above all, don't gossip. It is a poison. You think you're winning people to your side, but you're just dumping arsenic into the water well of the church. If something needs to be dealt with, you deal with them. One-on-one, -on -one, in small groups, behind closed doors, in private. Another key mark of a peacemaker is, are you correctable? At work, at home, with your friends, would your spouse say that you are correctable? The reality is, is conflict, disturbances, it, it's inevitable with sinful people. Are you correctable? The book of Proverbs says that a fool is someone who hates correction. You correct a fool and he will hate you. You correct a wise man and he'll love you. In fact, a wise man will be able to take the golden nuggets out of any correction that comes his way. The fool gets mad and defensive. Which one are you? Jimmy Evans gives 10 uh, attributes of emotionally healthy people. We don't have time to go through all 10, but I want to pull out two because one is, can you complain and confront issues in a gracious manner? Do you have the ability to confront issues and can you do so in a gracious manner? Or do you become aggressive, angry? Raise your voice so that you can dominate the situation. Is that how you confront? Or are you filled with the peace of God? And secondly, can you receive complaints, rebukes, correction in a non-defensive manner? Or are you passive aggressive? You receive it with a smile and then you wait for your opportunities to jab right back. With a snide comment, the whole time rooting for their failure. 
the fruit of the Spirit of God is peace, a calm assurance, a rest that comes from God in the depth of our soul that fills us that shows us that God is in control in life and in circumstances, that peace that overcomes. And when it fills us up, it allows us to overflow to others. No longer needing others to fill your tank because Jesus already has. And because he has, I can be a peacemaker. Question for you, church. Is there someone right now that the Holy Spirit is pressing upon your heart that you need to do business with this morning? In the church, in your family, in your neighborhood? The scripture says, leave the altar. Go and do business. Then you come back and you give your offering because you're offering first is to reconcile. As far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. In 1918, World War I was billed as the war to end all wars. It was followed by the Kellogg Pact of 1928, an international agreement that this will, this will solve all all war disputes from here forward, signed by 62 nations, the U.S. included in that signing. Oh, the pageantry and the jubilation of such a great event. Finally, peace on earth. We've accomplished it. It has come at last. That wasn't until the next war. How's that working for us? The reality is, is the world will never be able to accomplish peace on its own. In complete contrast, there is a supernatural peace that God gives. We sang this song earlier, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Horatio Spafford a businessman from Chicago had sent his family across the sea because they were going to Europe and, his, and the ship went down and shipwrecked and three of his daughters died and he received a memo back from his wife who had made it safely that said, our daughters are gone. And while he was on his ship following behind, the captain called out, this is the spot where that previous ship went down. That's where he wrote those words. When sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Where does peace like that come from? Jesus Christ. Right now we have missionaries Across the world, Christians who are going and entering into war zones, into, into incredible conflict, and they do so with the attitude that says, if God is calling me, I am safer in the will of God than anywhere else. Where does peace like that come from? Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul when the Bible opens up with the snapshot of his life, he is a terrorist. He is angry. All he sees is red as he's persecuting the church, as he's spilled with venom. He cannot sleep because he pursues and he pursues and he pursues. The final scene of his life that we have is in 2 Timothy. He knows he's about to die because of the name of Jesus Christ. He says, I've finished my race. I've run my course. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. 
Where does peace like that come from? Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, all across this room, I pray right now in Jesus' name that if there is anyone here that does not know you, whose heart is crying out, God, for peace, peace that comes from you, peace that lasts all of eternity, God, would you give them faith? Would you allow them to see and to realize that through the blood of your son, his finished work on the cross, you have provided peace if they will cry out in faith and repent. If they will call upon the name of Jesus. Father, as your sons and daughters, we pray that you would help us to abide in you and to walk in peace. We confess how, how leaky our buckets are and how distracted by the world we can become. Would you give us peace? Peace that overflows to those around us and that the testimony of our lives and the life of this church and the community would be that we are peacemakers because we are sons of God. That we have the character of Christ. That God, we allow you to defend us and to fight on our behalf because we rest in you. A character that this world longs for. And it's our time to show the fruit of the spirit of peace. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.